Have you ever looked up at the night sky and wondered whether there might be intelligent life out there, perhaps another civilization? Well, I certainly have. Um, as an astronomer, it's pretty much in my job description to try to sort of crack the mysteries of the universe. And this problem, the one about extraterrestrial life, has been with us for a very, very long time, and it remains unsolved. We don't know exactly how long people have been thinking about this stuff, but we can trace speculations on life in outer space at least back to antiquity, so a couple of centuries BC. Compared to our ancestors, however, we are in a privileged position. Thanks to the very large telescopes that we have today, we are in a much better position to get an answer to whether there is life in outer space than all the generations that have come before us. So today I'm going to tell you about new ways to search for our cosmic neighbors. It wasn't that long ago that SETI, which stands for Searching for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, so basically intelligence beyond Earth, was considered something of a no-go area in science, generally very bad for your career. Um, but this is changing, and it mainly has to do with discoveries that have been made by the astronomers that study exoplanets. So exoplanets are planets outside our own solar system. So in the early 1990s, we didn't have any secure detections of any planets outside the solar system, but now we have thousands. And this has sent ripples through the scientific community and basically transformed the way we think about the universe and our place in it. So we now know that there are lots of rocky planets out there. We also know, like the Earth. We also know that some of these planets are at the right distance from their host stars to sustain liquid water on their surfaces and we call these planets habitable. And these ones are important because, uh, at least on our own planets, planet Earth, all life that we know of uh, relies on liquid water. So, we have found lots and lots of uh, habitable planets out there. So, if we take everything we know about um, exoplanets and combine this with everything we know about the universe on large scales, we can estimate that there are on the order of a billion, billion habitable planets in total in the observable universe. Now that number is, is huge. It's so large that it's very, very difficult to wrap your head around. So in astronomy, we sometimes use the analogy of sand. So let's, um, let's imagine that you're sitting on some lakeside beach about the size of that one, and you're, pu putting up, you're picking up a handful of sand. At that point, you're holding on the order of a million grains of sand in your hand. So that number is not even close to this one. In fact, uh, there are more habitable planets in the observable universe than there are grains of sand on that entire beach. Okay? So what this means is that unless the probability for the emergence of intelligent life on a planet is very, very, very small, then we should have cosmic neighbors out there somewhere. It doesn't mean, however, that the aliens have to be nearby or easy to find. So, how do we search for our cosmic neighbors? Well, it all started with searches for communication signals back in the 1960s. So back then, people were using radio telescopes like this one to search for communication signals sent from other civilizations. A couple of decades later, people started to look for laser pulses as well. But in both cases, you're basically looking for the cosmic equivalent of a hello. And in more than 50 years of searching, no cosmic hello has ever been received. Um, I, I don't, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think this is an important endeavor, I think it needs to be allowed to continue, but it, so far it has led us nowhere. And there may be several reasons for this. Uh, maybe the aliens are too far away to communicate that with us directly, or maybe they basically consider us to be too primitive to be worth uh, communicating with. If this is the case, then there is no, no real hope in this type of search. Luckily, this is not the only game in town. So I myself am involved in another kind of SETI, where we're not searching for communication signals, but rather for alien technology, signs that the aliens have built something in, in outer space. So what sort of technology might the aliens have? And now I need you to think big, okay? There is no reason to suspect that another civilization would be at exactly the same uh, technological level as, ours, as us. They could be thousands, perhaps even millions of years ahead of us. So we need to consider stuff straight out of science fiction, okay? 
And the way we do this is basically a three-step process. Step one is we try to imagine the sort of technology that the aliens can have. And then we try to figure out if this technology exists, how would this actually affect what we see in our telescopes? That's step two. And step three, we actually set out to look for those, those effects in our astronomical data. So I'll give you an example. This is a so-called Dyson sphere. So this is a theoretical construction that's named after the theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson, who came up with this in the 1960s. Um, so basic, the basic idea is that this is something that you build around your whole star, the sun in our case, in order to harvest energy in the form of starlight. The amount of energy emitted in the form of light from stars is enormous. So in the case of our solar system, some of that is hitting Earth and keeping us warm, but most of it is just lost from the solar system. If we could somehow tap into just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of that, we would have access to more energy than produced by all the power plants on Earth. And the Dyson Sphere is designed to do that. So there are different versions, um, there are different designs for Dyson Spheres, but basically you build a very large number of satellites where each satellite is equipped with a very large solar panel that collects starlight. So in this particular case, you have placed satellites on rings around the sun. So the sun would go in the center of this structure. So you might ask, okay, so this collects a lot of energy. What would the aliens use this energy for? And we don't know, of course, but they could use it to fuel uh, colonies in part of the solar system that would otherwise not be able to sustain life. They could use it to power vessels, colonization waves, either on interstellar scales, so in between stars, but perhaps even on intergalactic scales, which is in between galaxies. It's also been argued that they could use this to power some sort of cosmic scale supercomputer for some serious number crunching. I myself am using this telescope, Gaia, to hunt for, for Dyson spheres. So when most people picture a telescope, they think about something standing on the Earth. But Gaia is a space telescope. Uh, so it's been launched and it's actually into space and it's actually orbiting the sun right now. Now, the main goal of Gaia is not to hunt for aliens, but we believe that this can be done, and this is how it works. So, if we assume that we have a star, and we cover it with a Dyson sphere, so lots of satellites covering the surface, then it will become fainter and fainter and fainter as I add more and more satellites that block the light, at least if I consider the sort of light that the human eyes is sensitive to. This actually interferes with one of the standard methods of estimating distances in astronomy. So in astronomy, in general, if I know what sort of star I'm looking at, I know how much light is emitted from this every second. And how faint or bright this object appears in my telescope on Earth just depends on how far away Earth is. So the distance from my telescope to this is what determines that. The problem is that if I cover this with a Dyson sphere, it will become faint for reasons that have nothing to do with distance. So usually, if the star is nearby, it appears bright to us. If it's far away, it appears faint. But if I cover it with a Dyson sphere, it will appear to be further away than it actually is, because it's faint. The beautiful thing about Gaia is that it allows us to estimate distances to stars in a way that has nothing directly to do with the brightness. So if this standard brightness, um, brightness method of estimating distance tells me that this particular star is far away, but Gaia tells me that, no, it's actually nearby, then I may have found a good candidate for a Dyson sphere. And Gaia provides us with an enormous database that we can use to search for these effects. So eventually, Gaia will provide a data catalog with around 1 billion stars. And large databases like these are becoming more and more important in astronomy. So astronomy has entered the so-called big data era. And it's estimated that in the coming decade, we will have on the order of 100 billion objects in our data catalogs. And this provides a very bright future for this type of SETI. We basically imagine the technology, and then we set out to look for it in our astronomical databases. There's just one problem. What if we simply don't have what it takes to imagine the sort of technology that aliens might have, no matter how hard we try? So I remember once giving a talk on SETI pretty much like this one, where I was trying to impress the audience with these great telescopes that we have today and these enormous databases. And afterwards, this elderly gentleman came up to me, and I could tell from the expression on his face that he, he simply wasn't impressed. 
And here's what he told me. Imagine that you're living on Earth some 10 or 20,000 years, 20, years ago, so during the Stone Age. What sort of fancy future technology do you think you would envision? And I have to admit, I was a bit dumbstruck. I didn't know what to answer, so he sort of helped me along. And he said, well, it kind of makes sense to wish for things that would make life easier for you, right? So maybe you'd wish for a fire that would never go out. Maybe you'd wish for a cave that members of rivaling tribes wouldn't be able to enter for some reason. Or maybe you'd wish for a way to communicate with members of your own tribe if they're off hunting somewhere very distant. And all of that made, very, um, that made sense to me. But then he sort of smiled and put his hand into his pocket and he said, do you think you would ever end up envisioning something like this? And out of his pocket he takes a cell phone charger. And I had to admit, uh, no, if I was living during the Stone Age, I would probably not envision that sort of technology. And that was exactly his point. Um, so, basically wishing for something and envisioning the sort of technology it takes to make that wish come true are very different things. And certain things are very, very difficult to envision until some other discoveries or inventions are already in place. So in this case, electricity and cell phones. Um, so there is a limit to the sort of future or alien technology that we can envision given our own technological level. And this leads to a bias, you see. So when we normally hunt for alien technology in outer space, we usually end up searching for things that are extrapolations of things we already have. So if you consider the Dyson Sphere, for instance, if you think about that carefully, it's really just a piece of technology we already have, a solar cell or a solar panel, just blown up to gigantic proportions. Um, and I basically think that if you want to, we have to ask ourselves the question, would we really be able to identify or understand the technology that has been made by civilization that lies thousands or even tens of thousands or millions of years ahead of us? And I'm not so sure that we would. So imagine that you are an insect that has somehow made it onto the circuit board of a modern computer. Maybe you would notice that this is a strange environment, but you would have no way of figuring out what this piece of technology was for or why somebody might build it. On a cosmic scale, we might be no better off than that insect. So there's a problem here. So how do we search for really, really advanced technology if we basically agree that it's you know, doubtful whether we would be able to understand it? And maybe there is a way. So, um, Maybe the way is not to look for specific technologies, but just to look for weird stuff in outer space. <laughs> uh, you can imagine that some advanced alien tech civilization might be able to sort of modify entire astronomical objects, moons, planets, stars, perhaps even you know, entire galaxies through some fancy astroengineering. And if that is the case, those objects may end up with properties that are very different from natural astronomical objects. And one way to find those is to look for outliers in our enormous astronomical data catalogs. Now, in most cases, the outliers will have nothing to do with aliens. In fact, in you, the, the standard assumption should be that it's not aliens. St aliens should only be your very last resort once every other possibility has been ruled out. But spending time on looking at the outliers is not a waste of time, because even if we don't discover aliens, we might learn more about unusual astrophysics or the universe in general. So it's not wasted. There is also another way, and that is not to look for the unusual, but to look for the impossible. So this is a famous quote by the science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke, um, and it goes, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. To one, so one way to look for really advanced technology is to take this quote quite seriously and look for magic in outer space. So how do we do that? We basically take our data catalog, and we have huge data catalogs, and then we make a little list of all the stuff, given our knowledge about exoplanets, astrophysics, cosmology, and so on, would not expect to find in that database. So we basically make a list of stuff that would seem to violate the laws of physics, and then we look for that. If we then discover something, then we might be onto something really interesting. So this there is a nice example of this. So this is, these are some results from a colleague of mine, Beatrice Villaruel, who has been looking for disappearing stars. Um, 
So stars shine for a very long time. The lifetimes of stars are somewhere between 3 million years and more than 100 billion years. So for that reason, the night sky tends not to change very much during the course of a human lifetime. In fact, the vast majority of stars that you can see in the night sky today were also visible when the first humans walked on Earth. Now, there are stars that vary in brightness, and there are stars that explode, but you do not expect the stars to just vanish without a trace, without any sort of fireworks. But what if they do? So Beatrice set out to look for these effects in some very old data catalogs and compare them to more modern ones. So to the left here, you see an image from the 1950s of a small patch of the sky where I have marked five objects, most likely stars. To the right, you see a negative image of the same patch of the sky where one of the objects is gone. That's not expected to happen. Now, personally, I don't believe that this has anything to do with aliens, but this is a nice example of the sort of stuff that we should keep an eye out for. So SETI, searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, is usually considered the most extreme form of a high-risk, high-gain endeavor in all of science. And some people would even say that it's more related to science fiction than to astrophysics. On the other hand, few people would contest that if we one day were to detect an alien civilization, then this would be one of the greatest discoveries of mankind ever. We don't know how long we have to keep up the search, though. It might be for a very, very long time. So from that perspective, I think it makes sense to do this in the cheapest, most sustainable way possible. And I think the road forward is to use these enormous astronomical databases uh, that we are getting in the coming years. So these databases have been compiled with very general science goals, and we will have them uh, regardless of whether we choose to do, use, use them for SETI. So if we will have these databases anyway, doesn't it at least make sense to take a quick look at what sort of weird stuff might be hiding inside? Personally, I think it does. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um